Now, this is where it gets interesting, right? So once you equate the dose, right? So once you make it on a milligram per milligram basis, the agdisone group destroys the testosterone group. What's up guys, Derek, moreplacemoredates.com. Today we are going to be talking about ecdysterone versus steroids. Yes, we have Team 3D Alpha back with another video on ecdysterone. And um, I guess he touches on turkesterone in the video too because it's hashtagged. And he is comparing the 600 milligram um, dose response study using testosterone and anthate presumably to the 12 milligram ecdysterone study. And here he's going to make an argument purportedly about how ecdysterone could, you know, milligram for milligram hang with something like test. But let's go through the video. I'll give my insight. Hey guys, what's going on? Megan here. Now on a milligram to milligram basis, right? So comparing uh, dose per dose, look at how much more powerful ecdysterone is compared to the testosterone group. And again, this is on a per milligram basis. Now, does that mean that ecdysterone, which is natural, by the way, uh, is more anabolic and more powerful than testosterone? Well, let's find out. Now, again, this is another episode of Testosterone Thursday. Today is Thursday, so obviously we're discussing testosterone as usual. And lately, I've been bombarded with questions on ecdysterone and turkesterone. So pretty much ecdysterone has hijacked the Testosterone Thursday series. Okay, so if you saw there, there was a visual that came on the screen about turkesterone. Turkesterone is just the rarer and slightly more anabolic version of ecdysterone. So yeah, it is definitely harder to procure and in at least... The research available seems to be more anabolic and in practical application, I think it does have a bit of an edge. However, like I said, individual response. There are a lot of guys who, again, not comparing efficacy of dianabol and anadrol to ectosterone and trichesterone at all. I'm just using it as a comparable like brother sister scenario because that's, you know, something that would commonly be used in the anabolics world. People would say, you know, some people, their favorite oral is Dibol. Some people, their favorite oral is Anadrol. Some people respond horribly to one or the other, but respond amazingly to the other and vice versa for another individual. So a lot of the time, this doesn't necessarily boil down to which one is the most efficacious on paper. And therefore that is the one that has to be the best one for you. Sometimes it's individual response too. How many times has you, have you been to a doctor and you know, you, uh, had to get prescribed, you know, fill in the blank drug to treat some sort of thing. And then maybe you had to switch to another drug because it wasn't effective for you. Whereas for the next guy, it worked just fine. Maybe to get rid of your headache, you know, Tylenol works better than ibuprofen or vice versa. You know, everyone has their own individual drug response at the end of the day. And the same would apply for something like turkesterone versus ectosterone. So it's not just about Turk is better on paper. So therefore it's better for you. Not necessarily the case. Check this one has hijacked the testosterone Thursday series. But anyway, let's bring out the Vegeta Scouter as usual. This is what we're analyzing. So I'm picking two different studies here, right? So we're picking the famous classic uh, study from Basin in 96, where he's pretty much uh, comparing the effect of testosterone uh, at high and low dosages versus the effects of training natty, right? So that's the study that I, I've covered it several times where you have the natty group and you have the enhanced group, and he pretty much wanted to see. Uh, what the difference in gains would be. So I'm using that study where they're obviously using testosterone. We're going to focus on a group that took 600 milligrams of testosterone, right? The very, very, very high uh, dose group. And then we're going to compare it to the study that I've covered last time from Eisenman, right? Which is the best study done, like, done on like testosterone on humans uh, to date, where they obviously administered uh, ecdesterone. Now remember on this study that we're giving uh, I'm using the low dose group, right? So that took 12 milligrams of ecdysterone per day. It was supposed to be more, but again, watch the video that I made on there. I go into details. So they got 12 milligrams of ecdysterone per day, uh, which comes out to 84 milligrams per week, uh, compared to this group, which took 600 milligrams of testosterone. Per week. Yeah, something a lot of people do that I've realized over the years is when they're comparing like compound versus compound, and they think, oh, you know, fill in the blank oral steroid is stronger than whatever you know injectable preparation of you know testosterone whatever it is they're often forgetting that the dosage that they're looking at is a daily dose so if you're using 50 milligrams of anadrol that's actually 350 milligrams of anadrol per week you're not actually getting it's you know like when you say oh only 50 milligrams of anadrol versus like 300 400 500 tests whatever it is you really are actually comparing you know 350 milligrams of anadrol versus you know 400 500 tests 
because that's the cu cumulative weekly dosage. So when you are trying to compare like tit for tat efficacy, you have to be looking at the weekly summation rather than, you know, the daily dose for whatever, you know, oral that you're using on a regular basis. Now, first, if you look at the bench press gains compared to the placebo, remember, we got to compare the gains uh, to the placebo group, right? We can't just look at the gains from study one and compare it to gains study two, right? Because there's obviously differences in design and things like that. So we're just looking at uh, the gains compared to each study's placebo group, right? So the testosterone group, they gain over 26 more pounds on their bench press, right? Compared to the placebo group, right? So they added 26 pounds to the bench press more than the placebo group, right? The, the, obviously the total gain was more than that. On the ectosterone group, they've added about 13 pounds more uh, than the placebo group, right? So at first it looks like testosterone is the clear winner, right? I mean, 26 pounds more compared to 13 pounds more than, than each uh, uh, placebo group. But remember, the testosterone group was taking 600 milligrams of test a week. That's a lot, right? Again, compared to 84 milligrams of, uh, of ecdysterone. So even if you factor out the weight of the ester, that's still a substantial difference, right? You're looking at about 420 milligrams uh, of testosterone. Yeah, so I can already see where this is going. If you end, if you took like 84 milligrams of active hormone after the ester is cleaved off, you would have a probably greater increase in bench press using the ectosterone than test. You would barely be replacing endogenous production if you had 84 milligrams of active in your system. Now, of course, that would be like you only produce 10 milligrams like free form per day at best if you're lucky. So, you know, you could technically argue you're like a little bit super physiological depending on, again, like your total test is not going to be impressive on 84 milligrams of active per week. Um, you might get a bit more disproportionate free T, a little bit, you know, lower SHBG from it, maybe eke out like something. But in the study we see with the dose response, you see at 20, 25 and 50 milligram dose of test, you actually lose performance. Now, again, of course, they were essentially self-inducing um, castration, if I recall correctly, using a GNRH agonist to shut themselves down to then get an actual representation of what the test alone is doing. So obviously, you know, 25 and 50, you can't say for certain it's going to lower your performance if you didn't use the GNRH agonist alongside it. But when you got to like, if I recall correctly, the 125 milligram group started to get, you know, a decent amount of benefit. I would speculate the 84... At an 84 milligram dose, guys who are like active, you know, working out, like young, healthy dudes, probably are not, are going to at best like net even everything. Like I doubt you would gain shit. You would just be replacing what you naturally produce um, for the most part. So yeah, milligram for milligram, I can already tell you Ecti is going to beat it probably in strength outcomes. That doesn't necessarily mean though, for protein expression and muscle accrual, it's going to be a superior compound, although like in the grand scheme of things, because there still is a dose response curve at the end of the day. When you look at things like SARMs, when you look at things that are very efficacious at low milligram dosages, they don't necessarily linearly work like anabolic androgenic steroids do. Now again, AAS has a clear like dose response relationship too, where there is severe but diminishing returns but that diminishing returns line seems to be at a much higher threshold than something like SARMs, which, you know, milligram for milligram, at like, you know, if you compare three milligrams of LGD to three milligrams of any anabolic steroids, LGD is going to blow it out of the water. Doesn't necessarily mean overall, in the grand scheme of things, that it's a better compound, though. There's a lot of context that goes along with that. Compared to 84 milligrams of ecdysterone, right? If you remove the testosterone ester. So they're using five to seven times more, again, on a milligram to milligram basis, right? Than this group for just double the results. So again, five to six times more as far as dose is concerned. Obviously, they're not the same compound, but you know what I mean, right? So five to six times more, right, uh, to get about double the gains. Not to mention all the side effects that come with using such a high amount of uh, testosterone. Yeah, so like, there's definitely a good argument here. and But the main thing too is like ecdysterone, no HPTA suppression, whereas with test, even if you lowered your dose to the equivalent amount that would get the same you know, strength benefits, you're shutting yourself down versus not doing anything to your HPTA, having aberrations in biomarkers, hurting your lipids a bit, stuff like that, impacting your hematology, whereas with the ecdysteroids, steroids, seems to be no issues whatsoever. It sounds like overly enthusiastic about like saying it doesn't impact anything whatsoever, but I have not yet seeing blood work aberrations that show any significant deleterious effects of their use, even at like really high dosages. Um, and that's even in women. So I don't know. It's like, it's very promising. However, I think like I speculate that the conclusion of this may be a bit of a reach 
you know, like where I see this going. Cause just based on the title alone, like I'm already going to tell you test is fucking way better, you know, like in terms of actual overall upregulating energy systems, a lot of the satellite interactions with that test has in the body that aren't just strictly related to translocating to the nucleus and inducing muscle protein synthesis, satellite interactions around the body that impact muscular performance, things of this nature, um, interactions with GH, IGF-1 axis, stuff like this is, this is not necessarily going to be leveraged in a way that ecti steroids can really like lean on and kind of enhance. So like anabolics work not just through their AR agonism, and that's, you know, big reason probably why SARMs are not that potent, potent in their effects. Um, at the end of the day, like overall at the high milligram dosages, there's things like antagonism of glucocorticoid receptors. There's things like increasing leverage in the gym just through like enhanced fucking saturation of your muscles with water retention. Like stuff like this is not going to be achieved with ecti steroids and is not really accounted for in some of this data. But again, like it's obviously very promising and I'm very optimistic about it and I become oh, increasingly optimistic as I get more feedback. I get a lot of messages on a nearly daily basis at this point, actually, with anecdotal feedback of guys saying, you know, they their PRs jumped by like 30 pounds on Turkesterone or, um, you know, 20 pounds or, you know, upwards of fucking 40 pounds in some cases. Now, again, some of these guys, like at the beginning, I was thinking like some of these guys are just like too newbie to the gym to even understand the difference. But like, after a while, dude, like these are plateaued guys, like guys who actually know what they're doing. They track their numbers. They're very diligent about their programming and they're breaking plateaus. So I definitely think ecti steroids, again, mentioned many times, not a miracle for getting huge. You're not going to get huge off this shit. Testosterone is going to blow it out of the water for making like lean, dry gains that are reasonable um, with no H. Like my comparison would be like ecti steroids or ectosterone and turkesterone in particular versus like Anavar. This is something that's like, you know, dry, lean, strength oriented. That's the sort of thing I compare it to rather than like a very hyper retentive compound like testosterone. It's really hard to kind of equate them when a lot of the stuff driven through test is not as just like clean contractile tissue. You know what I mean? So anyways, let's let him continue and I'll kind of chime in in a bit. Now, this is where it gets interesting, right? So once you equate the dose, right? So once you make it on a milligram per milligram basis, the ecdysterone group destroys the testosterone group uh, when it comes to uh, relative gains, right? I mean, look at the difference from here to here. Ecdysterone is no fucking joke, guys. I've been telling you guys for over nine years now. Eat your spinach, eat your quinoa. So once again, now you see why WADA put ecdysterone on the monitoring program. Again, watch the previous video that I made on it for more details. But they were not crazy. Remember, they're the ones who funded the study, right? They're the ones who funded the study. Okay, everyone who's done this, used this stuff, and eaten a shit ton of spinach and quinoa, I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce it. Maybe he's saying it correctly, I'm saying it wrong. I've always said it as quinoa. Let me know in the comments down below what your results were like using a shit ton of quinoa and spinach versus when you use an actual supplement, whether that be Turk, whether that be, well, I guess like more accurate for this, you know, the representation of this video is the ectosterone because you're not going to be getting that through your fucking, your quinoa and whatnot. So I don't know, let me know because I have actually seen some feedback at this point. And again, it's all been on the supplement side though. I've never seen anybody just mega dosing food necessarily to achieve the same you know, like blood serum concentrations necessarily. So um, that would be interesting if you have any anecdotal feedback. Um, go to hub of information probably in this video right here because when people type this shit in, there's not a lot of search results. So if we can have some good uh, consolidated feedback, that would help a lot of people make a more informed decision here. Uh, from Eisenman. And after the results came out, they were like, holy fuck. You know, keep in mind, like I said, like, this one's been around for decades. It's just we never really had uh, well-designed studies on humans until the Eisenman study. And that's when what I was like, fuck it. You know, we got to put this bitch on a monitoring program. It just has way. Imagine the water guys like in the office are like, fuck, we got to put this bitch on the monitor. <laughs> Saying it exactly like that. Way too many effects, right? Again, in the last video, I went over the anabolic effects, right? The effect on strength, protein synthesis, insulin sensitivity, recovery, blah, blah, blah. But it has so many more. If you guys want, I could make more and more videos 
on the rest of the effects of a digital one. I mean, there's there's so much research on it. You know, it's been studied extensively, even outside of the bodybuilding space. Remember, WADA would not put something on a monitoring program for no reason, right? There hasn't been a single anabolic agent on it for what? I think it was like over 10 years or something like that. But the reason why they haven't banned it yet is they're probably waiting for more studies. You know, someone else needs to replicate the Eisenman study and see what we find out. Now, which is stronger? Does that mean that existerone is stronger than testosterone? Not necessarily, right? It depends because I'm pretty sure if you take 600 milligrams of existerone, you're not going to get the same results as the group who got 600 milligrams of test, right? It just doesn't work like that. It's just existerone is much more powerful than testosterone at low doses, right? So if you're taking a low dose of existerone, which again, like I said, you don't need a lot to see gains, you know, something like 12 to 30 milligrams a day, which is easily found in uh, quinoa and spinach and fuck you guys i'm not saying quinoa that shit sounds stupid as fuck anyway, <laughs> okay so is that not how you say it that's how i've been saying it forever uh if you're getting low doses of uh of ecdysterone uh you're getting more bang for your buck compared to low doses of testosterone but obviously if you go into the high doses uh testosterone is king of course yeah it's, i guess that's accurate because if you if you took literally what you naturally produce you're not going to gain anything. You know, if you took 84 milligrams of free form test, you're probably not going to really do anything significant whatsoever. You're basically just, you know, shutting yourself down for almost no reason. Um, but if you add something that does not cause HPTA suppression on top of your natural test production, like expectedly, you're going to get some additional benefit above and beyond. So yeah, that's definitely true. In my opinion, frankly, you could say that for any supplement though. Basically you could say that for fucking, um, you could argue that um, well, I guess, you know, creatine is not a good example because you're literally using 5,000 fucking milligrams of it every single day. But yeah, this, you know, this is uh, probably the best example. You know, I can't think of something that's comparable other than another ectosteroid or like a SARM, I guess. But it's like, you know, that causes HPTA suppression, liver toxicity, etc. So um, it's not like that would be a superior alternative to a replacement dose of test kind of thing. So, but yeah, if you take just like 84 mgs of free form, te free form test, Basically nothing happens, you know, at best you might like eke out a little bit of something just by the stability of your hormones, like not being pulsatile and diurnal. So, but yeah, like obviously no one's going to cycle with literal, like exactly what your balls produce replacement test. They'd be using minimum like 300 plus. So unless, you know, they're doing TRT or, you know, borderline super physiological TRT at like 200 ish. But anyways, like when it comes to actual high doses, it does definitely seem like there is diminishing returns with things like SARMs with ecti steroids I'm not really sure yet so far like with turkesterone for example we've seen good results with two caps a day upwards of six caps a day I have yet to see anyone like mega dose above six a day to be honest but for example uh vigorous Steve's wife who is like a former um top figure competitor I forget exactly what league she competed in but it definitely wasn't like it was like muscular like a like a higher tier than just like bikini like it is actual like muscular like you know women with good proportions and you know cap delts and shit pretty much um she used it and it was comparable to a low dose of anivar um and she's like very in tune with her body knows her shit and um for her she didn't really see a big difference between the four capsules and the six capsules per day but with that being said there are you know guys who are getting better results it seems from the six caps versus the four um, it's a little bit, you know, up in the air right now, but it seems like in general around like the four capsule mark for, um, our Turk product in particular is, uh, you know, working pretty good. So now when it comes to the ectosterone low dose and whatnot, like it's sort of, tr it's true for Turk too, you know, the standardization for actual Turkesterone is not like the whole milligram contents of the capsule. Um, it's like the actual plant, like standardized down to 10% concentration. So that is um not like the full milligram amount of what is inside the capsule despite the fact that there's 500 milligrams of raw actives in it it is not comprised of 500 milligrams of active turk so even though the dose you know it's like one capsule equals 500 megs that's not all turk you know the dosage is literally a fraction of that because that is the the potent standardization you know 10 percent. but like when you actually break it down to how many milligrams that is it's a lot less. So I can see what he's getting at by, you know, outlining how low doses of ecti steroids are still very potent because when you actually, when you actually, when you actually break down the standardization of the active compound that you are trying to get out of them, essentially, it's much lower than it seems on paper equated to the actual raw, like whole form weight, if that makes sense. So, but again, you know, comparing anabolic weekly burden on 
like compared to a SARM or an ecti steroid is kind of like it's kind of like apples to oranges sort of because they're not even interacting with well at least with SARMs are interacting with the same receptor but with you know ecti steroids they're not even interacting with the androgen receptor so I don't know like trying to compare what AR you know expression is induced by fill in the blank anabolic agent versus a you know ER beta agonist I don't, like, I don't know. I don't know if the drug burden like really is something that should be even comparable. But at the end of the day, you know, yes, what he's saying is definitely accurate in terms of at least based on the data given and the fact that anecdotally, if you took, um, you know, 84 milligrams of tests, like it's not really going to do a whole lot. Now, again, 84 milligrams of ectosterone. I think it depends, you know, definitely depends on the source. But testosterone comes with side effects whereas like this one does not remember like this one there's virtually zero zero side effects on animals and on humans no liver toxicity no acne no hair loss no uh, issues with your blood lipids no testosterone suppression none of that right and it's natural whereas testosterone at high dosages comes with a fuck ton of issues again depending on your genetics and things like that how you respond to it right so which is stronger again at high doses testosterone is king whereas at low doses uh ecdysterone is king right and again ecdysterone tends to have this weird effect where as you keep increasing the the doses you're not getting uh a stronger and stronger effect it's, you know it's kind of weird which is why we need more studies uh to follow up on the Eisenman study because if you remember in the last video the group who had four times the amount of ecdysterone as the 12 milligram group did not see a uh, substantially more gain. So it seems like ecdysterone tends to peak after you reach a certain amount, which is probably around the 30 milligram per day dose. Whereas testosterone, obviously, you know, you keep on making more gains as you increase the dose up to a limit, of course. So conclusion, uh, testosterone wins at high doses and ecdysterone wins at low doses, right? And when you look at pros and cons and side effects, then like this one wins by far. And that's mainly because, like I explained before, like this one mainly works through the estrogen beta receptor, whereas testosterone uh, not only works through the androgen receptor, but through many other pathways, even outside of uh, DNA binding. Yeah, it also works on ER beta as well, you know, through its satellite interaction via its aromatization to estrogen. So testosterone also interacts with the exact same receptor as ecdysterone, just, you know, via a different downstream cascade, essentially. So long term, the androgen receptor is just way more anabolic uh, than the estrogen beta receptor. Again, long term and at high doses. Now, another question. So this is interesting. I mean, mentions here. One thing I should touch on is. Only free test is what's really active, not all of your T. So there's some evidence that is actually suggesting there is a sex hormone binding globulin receptor complex that actually deals with delivering androgens to target tissues through a mechanism that is independent of just free floating androgens in your blood. So I don't necessarily know that this is an accurate statement anymore to make that only your free test is what's actually going to build muscle because um, it seems like there are um, certain binding proteins in the body, even new ones I'm learning about now. It's like androgen binding protein or some shit produced in your balls, like weird shit that I've never even heard of that may actually play into like what gets delivered to where rather than just, you know, what's circling around in your blood, like finds exactly where to go. So I don't necessarily know that's an accurate statement anymore. However, you know, in general, like I get the point he's trying to make. Uh, then the estrogen beta receptor again, long term and at high doses. Now, another question I get a lot is, Megan, should I buy Turkisaron from Derek at more place, more dates? So I recently found out that he actually sells Turkisaron, which is pretty fucking badass, because like I mentioned several times, it's very, very hard to get your hands on on uh, Turkisaron, the right stuff, especially if you're trying to get it from foods. Forget it. So if he was able to uh, make a legit Turkisaron supplement, then kudos to him. Now, as far as whether you should buy a Turkisaron supplement, I might make a whole video on that. Right, because usually my answer is always hell no, but that's mainly because I don't trust most supplement companies, right? And from watching his review of my video, he seems like a pretty honest guy. He was objective, science-based, and even he was skeptical about most supplement companies. Right? Dude, Team 3D Alpha, shoot me a DM and I will send you some from our next batch. You can try it for yourself. You can let me know what you think about our Turk. And, uh, you know, log it on your channel if you want or, you know, make a video or not make a video, whatever. It's just uh, um, let you give it a shot because, you know, obviously we have overlapping interest in this topic and, um, you know, would be happy to send you some shit. So let me know if you are interested in that. All right. So I will say, you know, it's up to you guys. As um, long as it's legit. I don't see why not. I personally like to stay away. But that's for my own personal reasons. Like I said, one, uh, 
I like to know exactly what's in most of the products that I use. Uh, and two, like I mentioned before, we just don't have a lot of human data on uh, turkesterone. Oh yeah, so I should disclose too, ours is different and novel in that I have complexed it with hydroxypropyl beta cyclodextrin. So this is something that I felt was a potential novel delivery technique to increase bioavailability. And well, you should know if you're gonna take me up on the offer that that is also in the product. It's not just straight turkesterone. So if you want just a straight turk product, then I do not have that for you, unfortunately. But if you are interested still in the turkesterone complex that I've made, then uh, hit me up. We just know that in animal models, it's uh, more anabolic. And I would assume it's also more anabolic in humans. I don't see why not. Uh, we just need more studies and we just need more data on it. In fact, I would be so excited if we finally get some uh, well-designed studies on the effects of turkesterone because I've been waiting for that for years. But anyway, like I said, I'll make a whole video on turkesterone eventually. You know, it's pretty much like desterone on crack, right? Just about 20% stronger and pretty much the exact same effects. All right, let's say, guys. Let me know what you want me to go over in the next episode of Testosterone Thursday. See you in the comment section. All right, guys, don't forget to like or share the video. All right, so anyways, if you want to, uh, Team 3D Alpha comes up with a lot of interesting... Uh, natural bodybuilding type videos that help you decide on you know things that are worth spending your money on things that are not worth spending your money on you know diet techniques and whatnot so definitely check out his channel and um yeah hopefully hopefully you guys enjoyed that one as far as my overall stance again like i said you know anabolic steroids are always going to blow targeted compounds or like natural shit out of the water you know when i when i compare this to something I compare it to low dose Anivar because I think that is a more reasonable comparison. Like I don't really look at the dose response study in testosterone and try to equate it milligram for milligram because it's kind of hard to do that with a bioidentical compound that is otherwise something that is going to like net neutral you zero when you use like anything less than even like a hundred milligrams. Now I've, you know, obviously that's not necessarily true depending on a few different factors, but like in general, once you're replacing your natural test, you're kind of just like replacing it and getting a slight edge through the lack of diurnal dipping. So, um, and it's also, you know, very water retentive compound. There are a lot, of, a lot of other things that make it kind of hard to compare it milligram for milligram. So personally, like I said, the most realistic comparison I have is to low dose VAR and it seems uh, pretty close, but without the aberrations and blood, blood work. Now, again, how much is like five milligrams of Anivar going to like fuck with your blood work? Honestly, not a whole lot, but definitely is going to do, you know, have a little bit of kidney stress, have a little bit of, uh, you know, modulation of your lipids in an unfavorable context. Definitely gonna have some minimal, a little bit of uh, some suppression. You know, things are going to get thrown off a little bit. It's just, but again, like five milligrams is like, barely anything. Whereas with Turk, I see, you know, no HPTA suppression, um, which is crazy considering it literally interacts with estrogen receptors. Um, no hepatotoxicity, no kidney stress, um, no aberrations in hematology. Um, nothing really out of the ordinary, to be honest, not even aberrations in SHBG. Interesting being an oral compound because that's something that's going to get fucked up too when you're using like an oral Anivar or something. So anyways, ectosterone, I do, uh, I do actually think ectosterone is promising and I will, uh, uh, I don't even know if I mentioned, but when we were researching and I was guinea pigging Turk and Ecti before we made our own, we actually tried Ecti too. And we actually complexed it in the same way. And it also works. I just went with Turk because that was the one that had the most promise for me. And it seemed the most novel approach to, you know, this natural Ecti steroid application because um, at least on paper, you know, it's more efficacious, like I said, but ectosterone definitely works from what I have seen. Um, now, again, my anecdotal feedback has a much smaller sample size with the ecti than with the Turk, but from what I've seen, definitely works and is comparable in its effects. Uh, maybe, you know, has a not as much of an edge as Turk. It seems like Turk is actually, you know, plays out to be a bit stronger in real life, sort of similar to these studies. Um, but it's still, you know, unique in that it does not have those uh, aberrations and blood work. It seems pretty well tolerated. Seems pretty reasonable as like a natural thing, even though it definitely will be uh, potentially added to a banned substance list soon by what? And at that point, does it become unnatural? Like, I don't fucking know. At least right now it is natural. And, you know, what your definition of unnatural is kind of, you know, it's like <laughs> who can fucking determine at this point, you know? So... Anyways, hope you guys enjoyed that. Definitely more videos on Turk and Ecti in the future. Um, thank you guys for watching. Like, subscribe, check out my blog. 
moreplaysmoredates.com. Follow me on Instagram at moreplaysmoredates. Facebook, Snapchat, Bitchu, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. If you want to support the channel, you can check out anything I'm associated with in the video description below as far as when we're going to restock Turk. Like, be patient. I do not want to just put out straight raw Turk. I want to complex it in the way we have been, and this unique preparation is quite time intensive. So, you know, if just shop with another company if you just want to try it that bad. There are a lot of, there are companies that sell like Turk, you know? that the right standardization and it definitely works in my opinion even without the um complex added i just believe that this novel preparation could be um at least anecdotally seems to be you know doing what i hoped it would to begin with so anyway stay tuned for that i'm hoping to streamline the manufacturing process in a way that allows us to you know make this in greater quantities and much reasonable much more um fast time frames but again not the easiest thing when you are trying, when you're overcomplicating the fuck out of the process with something like this complex. So um, bear with me. Obviously, you guys know I would rather take more time and put out something I am super happy with and then put out something that is just a margin grabber because it's, you know, people just want it, you know? So anyways, thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.